This is James Arnold Taylor, voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Welcome to a more civilized podcast. This is the podcast you're looking for. You may not go about your business. Stay here, listen, and then move along. Hey, listeners. Hey we there. We are here. I'm Kyler. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And we are here on top of it, more than usual, recording yes. an actual intro for this episode that we cut in half. Yes. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So my Tasty. spontaneous cutting we're actually making up for. Thanks, guys. No kidding. Me, yeah. Helps me yeah. Out. Feels great. We wanted to highlight your good work, Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You do a lot. <laughs> it's true. Last This last week, Ross messaged us and was like, hey, guys, my work schedule's heavier than I expected. I'm not going to be able to get this whole episode done. Would you be all right if we split it? And I had this moment of like, oh, maybe we could have... No. No, we really couldn't. Like... There is absolutely jack that Kyler and I can do to help Ross with this editing. We are completely at his mercy. Well, there was one thing we could do to help him, which was agree to cut the episode in half. Yeah, yeah, which is what we did. (laughs) It was simultaneously the most and least we could do. (laughs) It is true. Wow. It was our only option. Does this mean, like, you can check off That's new levels of adequacy, I think, doing the most and least simultaneously. Can you check off being in two places at once? We're in two states of of being? Yeah, we're we're Schrodinger's podcasters. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Suspended in a state of simultaneously doing both the most and the least. So before we get right back into the discussion where we left off... We're going to have Ross do some news. That's some right. regular Star Wars news. So that we can stay consistent That's in, right. across all of our episodes. Meaning, we're going and doing some newsy <laughs> <No>. news. <laughs> <not> some regular <laughs> news. I almost thought he was going to let you get away with it. I nice. know! That was nice for us. <laughs> you thought I missed it, but you were wrong. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> so, to start us off, we have pivotal, vital information for all of you. <laughs> I'm so excited for there, this. <laughs> there, there has been an announcement. A very special oh, announcement boy. that I'm sure you've all been waiting for. Yeah, I because the, the demand for this could not have been higher. Exactly. I mean, it's <laughs> it's been absolutely uh, colossal. Yeah, the clamor is deafening for this product. Star Wars is now doing a branded set of Barbies. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Star Warbies or Starbies. Star, yeah. Star Warbies. Star Warbies. I like that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, now, here's the thing. I thought Leia already had, like, an official Barbie. Not an official Barbie. Okay. So, they did the uh, Forces of Destiny, okay. like, mm, action figure right, things, but they're, like, the size of Barbies. I got some for my twins. They each got a pair of them, I think. Um... And they were really cool, like really cool accessories, like the costumes look good, they actually kind of look like the actresses, you know, mm-hmm. obviously stylized and things, but but you could tell like Padme kind of looks like Natalie Portman, Ray yeah. kind of looks like Daisy Ridley. Um, and now that you mention that, I can't believe I forgot this, Carrie has a, a Han Solo in Hoth gear. Oh, really? Yeah, Barbie-sized yeah. thing. Oh. But these, so. but these are going to be actual Mattel Barbie mm-hmm. brands. Yes, and you can tell it's basically... Barbie if she was going to, like, a nerd prom. Yeah. <laughs> this <laughs> like, is Barbie in cosplay. <laughs> not even that, though. It, like, because if you look at the... It's like, oh, she's in a Darth Vader-themed prom dress. Mm. Or it, like... Oh, I see, yeah. It's, so it's not even, like, that it's Barbie in cosplay. It's Barbie if she was like, I don't know anything about Star Wars. Let me look up some images and then have my dressmaker... Make me an outfit. Or alternately, Barbie, if she was like, I really just, I want to drag Star Wars into more aspects of my life. Can you make me some formal wear? (laughs) Or that, yeah. It could be that also. I'll give Barbie the benefit of the doubt that she's cool enough to be. Let's not accuse Barbie of being a fake geek girl. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Barbie's been geeking out about all sorts of geeky things far longer than we have. That's true. So, uh, but yeah, it's. But, like, you can tell it's Barbie. She even has, like, big, thick nerd glasses on one of them that I saw. Oh, really? It's, yeah, it's pretty silly. Because, <laughs> like, I saw, I'm like, Barbie Star Wars. I'm like, I've got to see this. i got to see what this is. Now, I didn't actually look through this article, but are they actually doing anything to, like, change the Barbie? Or is this no, literally just no, new accessories? No, that's what I'm saying. It looks like Barbie it wouldn't yeah. really on be the Barbie night that she got yeah. dressed up for a nerd prom. Well, didn't they didn't they have a big dramatic thing a while ago where they actually changed? Uh, yeah, I guess there was. They were Barbie's introducing various Barbies of shapes and sizes. Let me pull up a picture here true. for you because it's it's just that. it's regular Barbie but in Star Wars themed clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, 
wow okay <laughs> i'm kind of digging the r2 because that i mean that that you could see a cosplayer doing that r2 costume oh yeah that yeah. vader though is very cool I was thinking more like dominatrix. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, Ross is pretty cool. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> There's all types. <laughs> but you see what I mean though? Like it is the Barbie Barbie mm. in Star Wars clothes. Yeah. <laughs> but not so, costumes from the movies. Yeah. So. Uh I, I just it looks like there is a little face paint for two of those. One yeah, yeah. Vader has like a black mask thing on and yeah. it looked like sunglasses to me, sun like, or something. Yeah, yeah. goggles is that what or it something. Yeah. So these are currently available for pre order on Amazon. We'll officially <laughs> start shipping on November eighteenth. They come with a price tag of a hundred bucks a piece. Holy crap. <laughs> but that apparently hasn't stopped anyone because they have already made it into the top twenty of the retail giants best selling dolls. So apparently, Holy yes, cow. there was quite a demand for these. Wow, I take back my mockery, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> apparently there was clamor. I just didn't hear it. Huh. Wow, okay. Well, and you know what? I wonder if this is also... I don't know if this is just me, but uh, doesn't it feel like there are more women that are admitting to Star Wars love? There, Yeah, the the proportion... It, it, actually, if you pick just about any geeky fandom, the proportions are generally roughly equal between men and women these days. Yeah. Uh, often, like, with... Uh, I know with Comic-Con attendance this year, it's actually disproportionately female. Really? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Huh. So, I think it was like 55%. I don't remember the exact and number, actually, but that's increasingly And actually, now that you mention it, I think it was probably equal if not slightly edging out in favor of the ladies at Gen Con as yeah. well. Yep. As I kind of try to figure like or remember how many of each I saw. Yep. And also we're also neglecting like these are Barbies. That doesn't mean it's women buying them. Like Yeah, that's true. I'm sure there's plenty of dudes buying those. Well, and like if that's I fair. Well, like I if know. I were Rancho Obi-Wan, like I would feel compelled to get these just to add to the collection yeah. of Star Wars memorabilia, you know. But for you, so you do a lot more of, like, the toys and memorabilia than we do. Yes. Are you planning on picking any Absolutely of these? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't $100, would you still? If it was a 20 buck Barbie? If it were if it were something my girls were interested in, I would get it even if it were 100 But, that but would the be twins... Yeah. yeah, but the twins just aren't... Right. Even with the much cooler and, like, more action-y, you know, like, force, or, uh, Forces of Destiny ones... Like, they still just weren't... The twins just are not very girly. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm wondering if maybe a lot and of this might too be young, so. more adult women kind of trying to catch up on the years they may have lost and not having these options to them. That is also possible. So I'm, I'm sure it ends up just being, you know, a, a, a bookshelf decoration. Well, maybe, but... but, like, even my wife, who had to, because her family is not nerdy at all be a closeted nerd growing up mm -hmm. I don't even think she would want these I mean I, I guess yeah. we could ask her if she's downstairs but I don't think this is something that she would want so I don't know I mean Chris is gonna go ask they might, they might be gone to the pool hey, already <laughs> or was Christina gonna go to the pool I think so oh they did, were they gone yeah they might have all gone oh, to the shoot. pool now darn it that would have been when awesome. they get back We'll ask. We should, we'll ask, and like, I can it, cut it, in it, another it, addendum. <laughs> yeah, fine. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I mean, if it's in the, your top 20 dolls ever sold. Yeah. And the more I think is, about it, the more I'm like, no, there's plenty of, like, there's little girls who are going to want to play this, play with these. There are no longer little girls who will want them for nostalgia purposes or to play with these yeah. or want them for their children because, hey, maybe my children will want them. There are plenty of dudes that might want to play with them, kids that want to My boys would play with those. Sure. You know, those that just go in the stack with all the other action figures and mm -hmm. get played yeah. with in the same way. And there's uh, there's the hardcore collectors that have to have everything. And then there's the kind of creepy dudes that just want a sexy Star Wars lady on their shelf. And <laughs> so that's, that's a pretty wide range. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Anyway, uh, onward and upward <laughs> yeah. to the thing. I'm so glad you picked up on what I was doing, Tyler, <laughs> with that intro. Uh, to the actual yeah. news that has been clamored for. This week, there has been a massive, massive internet push about the rumors surrounding Ewan McGregor 
being quartered for a Obi Wan Disney Plus series. Mm-hmm. So we've heard these rumors many yeah, times. Yeah, they've been like for like a year. Yeah. There's been oh no, these are these have been well, popping up since yeah since right. Disney so landed the since, franchise. But yeah, so since Disney got it, like there have been rumors like this would be really cool. But I would say in the last year there was like a really big push of like yeah. please make this happen. Yeah, the rumors McGregor have definitely even, been accelerating. Yeah, and even you and McGregor in the last year has been like I'd be really okay doing this. Like mm-hmm. that would be something that I want to do. And then just in this last week, it's been... Well, see, and that's that's the thing that makes me think this might be more legit, is because, yeah, for the last year plus, it's been just these little, like, yeah, you hear it all over Reddit, you yeah. hear some of the other less reputable news sites uh, pick it up and start saying it's truth. But now, all of a sudden, it's everywhere. Yeah. Not like it's been before. Yeah. Well, and I, I kind of followed this almost by accident, because I saw the first article to be like, we have confirmation that he has actually signed with yeah. Disney. And I was like, sure you did. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, exactly. yeah you yeah, have yeah. Con- Sure. Okay. And it's so, like, I went and read the article, and I'm like, it's your typical, like, we have a source, we can't reveal who it is, because they will absolutely be fired. Right. But trust us, this is legit. And I was like, well, this does sound a little bit more, because the other ones in the past would be like, well, we heard, mm-hmm. but they didn't, like, they didn't go to the effort of making it be like, no, guys, for reals, this is a thing. And then over the next, like, two or three days, you had reputable source after reputable like major like magazines and news outlets being like we've also got in contact and also can't reveal but yeah this is a thing yeah so it's more than likely we're gonna see an yeah. announcement probably at d23 like chris was saying before the show no that was yeah, oh that was oh was it oh sorry yeah. i don't even um, know what d23 is <laughs> it's it's basically like disney con it's I disney mean. con yeah. oh okay. yeah cool. yeah where they just it's yeah. like Disney saying this is everything we're doing yeah okay. what the 23 ha- means I have no idea uh, yeah. it's oh, it's a uh, oh, fetch I used it's the to number know. of major media companies that they've bought out and <laughs> yeah <over>. no <laughs> it has something to do with like Mickey Mouse or something like that like mm. it, cause there's like Club 23 at Disney and stuff like that so it's like a significant number for the company oh. It's a um, progress report on the number of senators they've bought out in their effort to rewrite to, U.S. copyright law so that they exactly. don't lose the right to Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, let's be real, Chris. 23 is the number of, that they have left to buy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, please don't sue us, Disney. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're only joking. It's all satire. We don't mean a word of it. But Allegedly wanted, bought senators. <laughs> if you wanted to buy us too, hey, we can. I was for talking. Sale. <laughs> I was talking to some friends about this the other day because I always love to. I always love to imagine that like this board meeting that went on in Disney back when they were like, "Oh crap, our our contract is going to end with Pixar. We don't get along with Pixar. They're going to go to someone else for their distribution from now on, and that's a huge chunk of our money." What do we do? And then there's some guy in the back with his feet up in a Hawaiian shirt, smoking a cigar. That's just like. Folks, okay, hear me out. <laughs> Why don't we just buy them? Right? I mean, we can afford it. They're publicly traded. Let's just buy the whole company. And everyone looked around and went, well, yeah. Is there, is there a reason we couldn't do that? I don't think there is a reason. Yeah, we could do that. Let's just do that. <laughs> and then a couple years later, they're like, all right, this is going well. We own Pixar and everything. It's like, but you know, kind of struggling for content lately what do we want to do like pirates of the caribbean was big national treasure wasn't bad we'd really like to get out some more action live action heavy franchises for kind of the teenage <laughs> to young adult crowd and someone's just like guys guys let's just buy marvel it's the same guy same guy, yes, same same guy. guy. like whoa yeah. everybody and they're like what is it let's just buy marvel 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 made their own studio company they don't really know what they're doing i mean they're doing a good job of it but it's not like they're the experts we are let's just buy them buy it out it's like buy marvel studios no no buy marvel the entire company yeah we could do that a couple <laughs> years later they're, they're having a meeting and, and they're just like this is working really well what else can we buy? Room goes silent. Everyone looks at this guy. <laughs> that Hawaiian like, shirt guy. <laughs> pulls that cigar out of his mouth. <sighs> raises one hand. Star Wars. <laughs> and everyone goes, You can't Could buy we it. afford that? Do you think Lucas would sell us? Do you think Lucas would sell us? Like, that. Lucas would sell. <laughs> Do you know how much money we have, everybody? <laughs> I got a check. Here. And I was like, Well, let's. 
Yeah, let's have someone approach George. Let's let's do this. Boom. Four billion dollars later, they own Star Wars. Another meeting a bit later, it's like, all right, man, this Marvel thing is taking off. But there is no way we can buy there's no way we can buy Fox. Like that would be too expensive. Buy it. It's like, <laughs> dude, I know it's worth buy it. It's like, we can't afford buy it. <laughs> it's like, all right, we put in a bid. It is fifty-four billion dollars. It's ridiculous. Guys, we just got outbid. I don't care. <laughs> Buy it. Turns out Hawaiian shirt guy's Satan. <laughs> <laughs> so now, and then, and so we're, I think we're about, you know, 10 years away from, guys, we're going to lose our copyright on Mickey Mouse. I mean, we've got some contingencies <laughs> in plan. We've, we've copyrighted the ears separate from Mickey Mouse. So until that runs out, nobody can actually use Mickey Mouse anywhere because we can sue them for having his ears on his head. But... What, you know, what are we going to do? And just like, <sighs> let's buy the government. <laughs> it's like, you, you want to bribe Senate? No. Let's buy let's it. just wholesale buy, it. buy the U.S. government. They're What's crazy debt in right debt. Now? We can afford that. <laughs> let's just buy the U.S. government. Yeah. So we're about, we're about 10 years away from Disney owning the, the country, I think. So. You know what? <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> I'm really not. This is pretty draconian. Uh, yeah. Remember the tale of Darth Moose the Avaricious. Well, That's true. I mean, talk about draconian. We just had to re renew Carrie's student loan repayment plan. She had to fax it. Uh, <laughs> I hate that. That's excellent. It, it won't get better when Disney and they, it, it, they wouldn't let you email. I mean... Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, that uh, was a fun tangent. Ooh, that was a good tangent. That was a good tangent. <sighs> so, and with that, so we'll we'll report back when we actually have Kathleen Kennedy or Bob Iger saying, "Yep, this yeah. is a thing." Yeah. But this is... until then, rest assured, it's probably happening. It'll be a mini series <sighs> on Disney Plus. Yeah, Chris is. Well, I don't want it to happen, out. but you know, I can always just I'll not watch, watch it again it. after it happens. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna watch it the first time. Yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> I was gonna say I I can't I have to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Right? I'm I'm legally compelled at this. I'll point probably to watch listen, it. wait for some reviews, and then decide based on that whether or not I'm gonna watch it quickly or not. Well, and we're also doing this podcast, so there's good odds I'll just watch it for the podcast one way or the other. But normally my approach would be like, let's see what reviews it gets, and after seeing what a couple of reviewers say about it, I might go, you know what? Let's give it a year to just like distance myself. I have one more piece of news that I forgot to put on here. So we're just going to throw it in here because it's kind of relevant. Okay. So October 6th, I think it is, uh, Star Wars Resistance Season 2 premieres. Oh, yeah. And it's the final season. Yes. Yeah. Only two, Only two seasons. seasons. This That was shocking to me. Yeah. I expected, like, at least four, like, with uh, uh, Rebels. Yeah. Because, I mean, Dave Fallon, I mean, so here's the thing. In Dave I Trust, I think he does a, a really pretty good job at telling Star Wars stories. Um, love the Clone Wars. Uh, ended up really liking Rebels quite a lot more than I anticipated liking. Um, and by the end of Season 1 of Resistance, ended up really liking that a lot more than I thought I would, especially given the art style, which I hate. Um, you know, and it was awesome. So I, I thought that we would get more of that. Uh, and maybe bridging into, I don't know, past Episode 9 or something. Who knows? But the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, with 7 and 8 happening literally, like, m minutes or hours apart at yeah. most, I mean, they're back-to-back -back as, as a Star Wars movie. I believe, the, I believe the official canon is a week. It's been a whole week yes. at that point. Oh, but, is it? Yeah. No, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was a, a few hours. Anyway, but either way... I mean, that is back-to-back. -back. Yeah, yeah, that's... yeah, either way, almost no time at all. Um, Steve which let us doesn't right. leave uh, really much time to do anything after Season 1... Because season one ends with the destruction of Hosnian Prime. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> Wait, what happens to Hosnian Prime? Yeah. <laughs> uh, These so planets that I didn't know existed until the movie in which they got destroyed? Yep. Exactly. Just like Alderaan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, so like it's season one is everything building up to episode seven. Which means I thought for sure season two, and I think it still will, help bridge the gap between eight and nine because eight is just a continuation of seven right um but then i thought for sure we would see 
because episode nine is about to come out in December. Yeah, there's so definitely I, room to go on. Yeah, afterwards. so I thought they'd be like, cool, you know, get the first half, maybe even building up the first half to episode nine. Then you go see episode nine in the theaters. Cool. Oh, you know, whatever stuff happens there. And then the second half of the season is, you know, the aftermath or leading up itself to episode nine. And they just, you know, fudge the numbers or whatever. And then we would see post nine mm-hmm. stuff. But we're not getting yeah. that. I do wonder about, like, I can think of a lot of things that could cause that or a combination of a lot of, like, it could be if num- viewership numbers weren't what they had hoped and for. And that's what I was wondering. Um, it could be the them coming out with Disney Plus and going, you know, we don't want to have this awkward thing where it's airing on the Disney Channel but because that's where we originally started, but then just shifting it wholesale to Disney Plus midway. Maybe we just stop and do something else. And that was the conclusion I came to, I thought. Perhaps a combination of lower viewership, and then I was like, oh, but we've got Disney Plus coming out. But they've already signed the contract, you know, so to speak. Because the way Disney works is, even though there's the giant umbrella that is the mouse, Mm -hmm. they treat all of their companies within themselves as separate companies that have to make deals with each other and can't break them just like you couldn't break a contract with anybody else. Right. So where... Um, Lucasfilm has signed a contract with Disney Channel to air this TV show, and now we're starting Disney Plus, which is a separate company. I think there's too much internal paperwork for it to shake out. And yeah, so they just said, okay, well, wrap up your story, Dave. This is yeah. where we're going. And I'm sure that they had informed Filoni, like, this is where this is going to head, so make sure that you, yeah. you know, I kind of feel like, too, right now, that if if Resistance's numbers had been disappointing at all, we probably would have heard it. Yeah, and it, it doesn't seem like it's, uh, you know, ter- like, kids' shows never get, like, crazy huge ratings, right? You know, you, yeah, get, especially 3 million, in the first you get 3 million viewers, and that's like, woo, awesome, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But, like, I've seen TV shows survive with, like, 1.6 million. Well, and and honestly, anything anything Star Wars related that's not one of the movies is going to get, like, you know, a a fraction, a minuscule fraction of the amount of viewers that the movies get. But that fraction of people who are just going to automatically follow it is enough to fill the standard, like, this is what keeps a show alive. And then you add into it the normal, like, targeted you know, kids that are going to be watching it, right? Yeah. Like, so I, I don't think that viewership is probably the problem. I think it is probably more of a Disney Plus is starting. Yeah, I we agree. are consolidating everything. This will be moving over there. It's and the same Disney thing Channel. that all the Marvel shows on Netflix. <clears throat> so. Exactly. And so I, I kind of hoped that they, and we haven't heard anything about this, but I hope that maybe we do get more resistance, but it'll just be on Disney Plus next year yeah. or something. Because, I mean, and I feel like that Disney likes Filoni enough that they don't want to just let him go. Oh, no. We haven't yeah. heard about anything new that he's working exactly. on. Exactly. Well, because Filoni, um, before Resistance got started, it was actually like, basically once Disney bought it, mm-hmm. they came to Filoni. They're like, we know you're working on the Clone Wars, so go ahead and finish this out. And as soon as you're done with this, they promoted him to basically head of all animated stuff at Lucasfilm. So everything except live action, he's the person yeah, in charge right. of like final say aside from Kathleen Kennedy so clearly Disney's trust in Filoni oh, yeah. is yeah. through the roof it's and not for a good problem reason. With him. and he's even directing uh, the first episode I believe of the Mandalorian oh is he really mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, John Favreau like he loves yeah, Filoni's work yeah. just like we do and so he was like do you want to come direct? <laughs> a know, third possibility episode? that I hadn't considered was also that it's possible that like season three or four of Resistance led to the apocalypse somehow and time travelers have come back in time <laughs> oh, no! to put the kind of on that. No, stop. <laughs> oh, oh, I hate time travel so bad. Stop it. Oh, it's well, I'm not trying to make you time travel. I'm no, just saying. Or it's, it not, was, it's not putting time travel. It was in your bad media. enough it's with the really time nice. travel light that they threw in in Rebels. I Season four Rebels, of Rebels, so. there's like some light time travel, and Yoda's basically like, "These are just windows. You don't get to go through and touch anything." Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good restriction. And I was but like, I "Oh, thank heavens!" Yeah, thank you, thank that's you. That's a little you. too Star Trek. Well, until he does. Yeah. Until he does. Yeah. But I was like, uh, "Okay, fine." whatever like she makes it this is just how she makes it so it didn't like mess up the continuity any you know what i mean well and probably i'm sure what happened is she got so popular 
in those last episodes. You're like, oh, oh no, we probably can't. No, Ahsoka got so popular before Clone Wars ended, and that's why she's in Rebels to begin with, is because yeah. she is a huge fan favorite. And then yeah. maybe killing her off was a mistake. She mm, is the no. number one hero in the Star Wars universe. She, she is. That's true. Number one most the heroic. most heroic figure in Star Wars. But I mean, see, that, that's what I'm saying, though, <laughs> is that they, they left it ambiguous enough that she could have been killed off. In yeah. That, and so they're like, well, let's just tell her. Well, I would have been fine there. with her dying. Well, that, that's uh, f- for another show. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Good save. <laughs> I want to. I want to have that discussion, but we'll save it for another mm. show. But anyway, we'll end the news here and return you to your regularly scheduled program. In other words, take it away past us. Hey. <laughs> so let's we're going to delve into now the Star Wars movies in particular and how they have used death, where they've used it well, where they maybe didn't use it as well as they could have, and maybe what they could do in the future that we might like to see from their deaths. And whether or not they need to step up more deaths like again, they don't need to be Game of Thrones, but So, episode 4, we have Owen and Beru, we have Alderaan and everyone on it. Obi-Wan people. Yes. Obi-Wan and Tarkin et al. You know, with the rest of the Death Star. Those are, I think, those, uh, like, this was all off the top of my head that I wrote down, but I think that's every death of any significance in A New Hope. Um, then we have Empire Strikes Back. We have Dax, uh, Luke's gunner. Oh, yeah. And that's basically Biggs it for that movie. in Episode 4. Oh, Biggs in Episode 4. Thank you. I forgot that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Biggs in Episode 4 um, definitely counts. And, and, of course, Porkins. How could we forget Porkins? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and you know what? I don't feel as much for, for Dax as a lot of those X-Wing pilots in the New Hope. Yep. And and uh, I would argue that most of the X-Wing p- pilots in New Hope are not badly done, but not very well done. Mm-hmm. Biggs, though, I would say stands out as one that's better done. Yeah, because he's mentioned before he's clearly got a relationship with Luke that we see. And yeah. So. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but Empire Strikes Back, I can't think of any other significant deaths in that not it's got second deaths. it's got second movie plot armor yeah in force. yeah i mean like it they now han gets frozen in carbonite which is not a death and is super effective yeah and and, and uh, this is actually a really good death but not death resurrection uh-huh. style thing that yeah. is done well this is yeah. an example of that done effectively yeah, other deaths, though, I mean, you have just, like, generic rebels yeah. at the base, and then I think that's it. I don't think anybody yeah. dies you, you, after you, I think off. some people get shot on Cloud City, like some stormtroopers oh, yeah, and that's some true. randos. But well, yeah. and you have a couple Imperial officers that get choked by Vader. Oh, oh yeah, Nita. that's true. True. Um, Which, that Nita would almost dies. veer into the humorous territory. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is Vader being bad. It is, too, especially because after he chokes, and he's like, you know, apology accepted, Captain Nita, and it's kind of yeah. like, oh, snap. But, but you know what, though, <laughs> see, that's the thing, is... is I think you can take it humorously, but I think it also establishes Vader as a ruthless... Yeah, that's one I forgot. The the kick the puppy trope. Like, we're going to show the villain being evil. The, the kick the puppy trope. It yes. has a name. It has a name. <laughs> oh, and I forgot one of my others. So you have the kick the puppy trope, which is very much... This is... The villain's going to kick a puppy or do something else that's horrible, mainly for the purpose of showing, whoa, the villain's horrible. Mm-hmm. Which is a good thing to establish in a story, so that's not a bad trope. Um, it can be predictable sometimes, like any of these, but... Uh, the other trope that I, I forgot to mention and I'm embarrassed because I love this trope because I named it. Like, I, I have never found anyone else having a name. And this is what I call this uh, the relationship death contract. That in a story, if one person in a relationship dies, then that means the other one has to die too because <laughs> we don't want to make people sad by having someone survive. Or if one survives, then the other one has to survive. And my favorite example of this is uh, the ending of the fi- the last battle in the Wheel of Time because Brandon had that out in force. Yeah. If you look at the people who died, almost every single one of them was in a romantic relationship with someone else who died. Mm-hmm. And and I was like, Brandon, you wimped out on me. You didn't want to show me people being sad because their loved ones were dead and so you killed them off in pairs. And as much as I love the fact that both Egwene and Gowan do not survive that because screw them, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little disappointed that I don't get to see either of them bitterly in pain either. <laughs> and it's like, again, I don't mind d- doing this here and there, but the fact that he did that repeatedly, where you have several where it's like, oh, they died, so now the other one has to die. Oh, this one's still alive, so, oh, it turns out Gala didn't die because Barrelane's still alive. Whoops. Well, and I think they also happened back to back too, didn't they? Most of yes, yeah. all of them. Well, yeah. I mean, back to back in that the last battle takes up almost that entire book. Well, but I'm but, thinking yeah. like, like... It's a 200-page chapter. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Well, and I mean, 
the last battle basically starts like 150 pages into that book and effectively lasts until like the last 50 pages like if yeah. you take everything ancillary related to that battle as a oh, whole. Oh, yeah, I was just talking about the chapter that's the named chapter The chapter titled The Last Battle, yeah. Is, is 200 and change p- Yeah, pages. it's enormous. So, back-to-back, for certain values of back-to-back. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It's like, so, Gawain and, and Egwene are a good example of that, though, where it's like, Gawain, you get the scene of him bum-rushing um, Demandred and getting killed, and then it's like, like 50 pages later that Egwene is like oh I'm gonna sacrifice myself the end and it's like oh wow well that was handy well cause uh like Swan and Gareth weren't they Swan like a paragraph same... apart yeah those they did no they died in the same explosion I think they literally died in the same attack no no, no I could be wrong cause it mentions it's been Gareth it's been a while it mentions Gareth um disappearing off into a a, a horde of, of Trollocs or something oh, yeah. like that which but. to be fair there is some reason for that like they've established that these two are he's her bonded warder and mm-hmm. when a Aes Sedai dies the warder basically goes crazy um because so I think, I think like there is some precedent like, for that but it's it is still. the fact that almost everybody that dies in that book dies in pairs yeah and it's cheapens it a bit for me so that's the relationship death contract. Um, okay, so then, um, episode six, Return of the Jedi, we have the Rancor. We have... <laughs> wait, wait, I mean, yeah, that Rancor true. gets more, more more mourning than most characters <laughs> yes, in this yes, entire does. series. So. Um, yeah, we, we see on-screen tears weeping brokenness. Yep. Yeah. Which death. is almost done as a comical thing, where it's like, look, they're sad about the Rancor. They loved it. Isn't and it but funny? it is kind of touching. Guy. Even yeah. as a kid, yeah. I was yeah. kind of like, yeah, it was scary. It needed to die, but... It's a nice little Aww. subversion yeah. of the mo- the movie monster, where it's like, this monster meant something to someone. It was his pet. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's cute. Um, you have Boba, who's not enormously Formality. significant for, within these, but, you know... Outside of the movies, he has developed yeah. significance. So, you have Jabba, Yoda, yeah, yeah. the Ewok. Yeah, the, <laughs> we all know the one—the one, the one yep. that gets shot by the ATAT oh, blaster yeah. and it's all yep. smoking and Daddy McStuffykins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And then we have the Emperor. Oh, that was good. And Oof. we have Vader. I mean, and, and there are there are some others like we do see uh, the A wing impacting and uh, taking out Admiral Piet. Is that there? And, but we don't know who that is. Fine. Yeah, but it's not it's not hugely important. None yeah. of those deaths are in very consequential, so I didn't really yeah. miss them. Um, so that's the original trilogy. In the prequels, we have very few. In Episode One, we have the racers that we mentioned, and then we have Qui Gon. Qui Gon. And, and did you go? Oh, and Darth actually... Maul. I forgot Darth Maul. Did we see how many of those racers actually died? Because I'm, I can think of. No, we'll go through different... that in another episode. But yeah. uh... there are several, even shots. I think there might have been deleted scenes where you would have just a pod floating down gently. Yeah, you do see the, some of that. The racer, darn, you know, hits the. Yeah, hits you the see that with Sebulba. Mm-hmm. Sebulba does that. Mahonic does that. I believe in a deleted scene. Yeah. So not even all of these die. Oh, and then but... what's also Quadrinero? Ben Quadrinero does the same thing. Oh yeah, He's where his yeah because his four engines go off. zooming yeah. off and yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so yeah, racers Qui Gon and Darth Maul. That's it for episode one. Episode two has Zam Wessel, which is very much the obstacle type death. It's like yeah. oh crap, they're dead now. We can't interrogate them. We have Shmi, which is far more significant. Uh, whether or not it's well done significance, we can debate in a moment. But <laughs> we have the various monsters in the arena. Which I listed... At first I was like, no, they're just monsters. But then I was like, no. Basically every single one of those deaths is given its own little moment of emphasis and screen time. Like, yeah, I'm going to keep those on Django. And Django was next, yep. Django definitely gets some. And that's about it. I'm still disappointed we don't see his head fall out of his helmet. That would have been (laughs) hilarious. (laughs) Uh. Like, Boba, oh, sad dad touches his forehead. (laughs) Plop. <laughs> way too dark. Way, way too dark. Not Star oh. Wars brand of humor. It's my brand of humor. <laughs> Mine <not> hilarious. <laughs> Roz is just shaking his head in disappointment. <laughs> I mean, I probably would have laughed. <laughs> but I'm a little ashamed. Uh, that's yeah. that's <laughs> we approve. To quote Roy from Order of the Stick, your, your approval, approval fills, fills me with shame. shame. <laughs> 
All right. Then we get episode three. We start off strong with Dooku. Mm -hmm. And then we get Grievous, the Jedi. (laughs) And then as a separate entry on the subcategory, the younglings. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then we get the separatist leaders and Padme. Yeah. So then, jumping to the sequel trilogy, what we have of it so far in Force Awakens, we get Finn's friend at the beginning, mm-hmm. but don't know don't know his number designation. I'm sure Stephen will tell us, but <laughs> uh, that is given a surprising amount of weight for a death in Star Wars, especially for a stormtrooper death. Yes, yeah. but, and I think that is what makes it so heavy is the fact that it's a stormtrooper who you are specifically not supposed to care about. Yep. And so it's like, it, yep. it's an impactful death anyway, but then the fact that... And um, I will also mention contracts. that it's done effectively enough that I forgot to put on my list the entire village that they were busily really slaughtering at that moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Lore Santeca. We have lore. Yeah, sure. I'm sure he He's had a name. He's the old man. Yeah, oh, I know who he is, yeah. but I'm just... This is one He's in there with pilot. Yeah, sure, this he has explorer. a name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, the village gets slaughtered. That is significant in s- establishing our villain's villainy. Um, but I, I totally forgot it under the effectiveness of nameless stormtroopers, nameless stormtroopers. <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty awesome in its own way. And then almost nothing for the rest of the movie until Han Solo. Mm-hmm. I'm debating if I should make Steven mad and look up the stormtrooper right now. <laughs> I won't, Steven. I'll let you do your job. I won't pull a Ross. <laughs> All right, no, and then okay. Last Jedi, we get Page Rico at uh, all, or Page Tico, my bad. Yeah, at all with the rest of the bombers. Um, we get Akbar at all, which the bridge command. Yeah, the bridge, the bridge command crew, mm-hmm. which I would argue is so, that's the one that I was like, yeah, that one wasn't very effective for me. I didn't even notice Akbar was there the first yeah. time yeah. I watched that no movie. No one did. That was the yeah. thing. Uh, you get Snow. I did. Helped. You get the Praetorian Guards, which is very much the Nazi, like, no, they're, they're dying so that the obstacles remove so that we can watch them be cool, and, that's, and then we'll move on. Um, most of the Resistance, as their <laughs> ships explode and everything goes on. Phasma? Question mark, we'll yep. know after Question December. Mark. <laughs> Gwendolyn Christie's still walking around with the others, so who knows. And, uh, is, wait, and is of she course. Still, is she still doing a promo? Has she been? I thought I, I saw her so. doing promo. Oh, no, well, maybe not. I'll have no. to look into it. Steven, let us know if she's still doing promo. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag... We're putting you to work, Steven. That's right. <laughs> Hashtag sorry, not sorry. And, of course, Luke. And then uh, Rogue One, we get... Uh... Uh, and then in Rogue One, we get every character that wasn't in a different movie. <laughs> that's not even like I was gonna list them out and then I realized wait I can actually express this very simply yeah. oh. uh, literally if they weren't in another movie they die that's that yep and then in Solo we get Val and Rio at the beginning or well early on we have L3 Dryden Voss and Beckett I may have missed some there because it's been a bit <laughs> I think that's all the deaths in... I looked up the cast list and went through all the characters and was like, yep, I think that's all of the... everyone that dies. I yeah. believe so. I think so. Yeah. The, that is significant. Yeah, yeah, again, that's not just There's, some... Yeah, random stormies dying yeah. here and there, but... I mean, would you even count the the Kessel uh, Overseer? Nah. Not impactful enough? Cause no, I, I mean, it, I guess he does. He gets taken in his office and... He, he yeah. falls under the, the obstacle... Death, yeah, I yeah, you could put that in. Yes. So, that's, yeah. I, but yeah, that's really. He's it. visually distinct enough, and it is given its own moment what about of the, uh, terrorist tentacle monster. In the... Tentacle monster, sure, you could put that. That's definitely an obstacle death, where it's like, okay, we've gotten past the death, or well, no, that's not an obstacle death. That's a yeah, it's obstacle consequence. That's the... Stephen, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the space squid. Um, yeah, so that one is a that is one of the inconsequential like Nazi deaths. That's I'm going to call that Nazi death from now on. The, the Nazi deaths, where it's like, well, of course they die. They, they die. The dying is the natural consequence of the heroes overcoming the obstacle they represent. And... Dying is the natural consequence of being a Nazi. That's what yeah. I thought you were going to say. <laughs> well, I mean, arguably. <laughs> Death is definitely the natural consequence of Nazism, so... Ew. Ouch. Yeah, I went there. Bring it real. 
All right, so that that is every death in the Star Wars movies. So we we get plenty of non consequential ops, you know, the Nazi deaths, and that's fine. Like I don't think that that I don't think that squid creatures' deaths or any of these others are poorly done. Like there's definitely an argument to be made about the psychological consequences of movies constantly portraying death without any consequence. Yeah, that's fair. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. I also don't think that every movie needs to delve into the consequences of wanton death left and right in you know it's an action movie um although one example i do like of this i recently read was the omega men the end is here by is a comic it's a green lantern or rather a white lantern comic by um tom king that dc put out and that one is that one is like the opposite of star wars like the the whole point of this is holy crap war is horrible all these deaths are horrible Everybody who's doing this is becoming horrible because of it. Ouch, pain, owie, I'm going to go cry now. And and it's really well done. I don't necessarily recommend it to everyone because it is a weighty read, but it is it is solid. It's really great. Star Wars doesn't need to be that. Like, there's a lot of people that like to talk about, oh, Star Wars, it's like, it has no consequence. And Finn, you know, we start out with this stormtrooper's death and then he just goes to slaughtering stormtroopers left and right without consequence. I would have liked a little more yeah. awareness from Finn if we're going to start that way. But again, it's not a horrible thing. It's Star Wars. It's action. It's fun. Most of the people that are dying, that the heroes are killing, are unequivocally, we're not worried about whether or not they're bad. Like The, yeah. the stormtroopers are Nazis, effectively. Mm -hmm. Like, that's literally where they got the name. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, okay, cool. You know, they, they're, they're obstacles. That's fine. Um, but in Finn's case is a good one where I do, it's like having Finn mow down stormtroopers without a second thought is a little inconsistent and i would have liked to see more more weight to those from yeah. him like if poe poe and ray are going around and han still shooting stormtroopers yeah. left and right without a concern cool that's fine they always have or without looking yes which, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh but finn should not necessarily be doing that yeah you know okay um owen and baru as i mentioned kind of gets forgotten it's not a horrible choice but they they definitely do just fade like he grieves ben more than he grieves his aunt and uncle that raised him yeah it's a little yeah. it's it's thoughts it's like that that's my main thing with a lot of the death usage in store in star wars it's not that it's bad it, it, it's basically that it serves the purpose it needs to and then they move on and that's that it's less realistic because of that it's kind of inconsistent because of that and you know that's not horrible that's okay but it's also not great. And I, I wouldn't mind seeing Star Wars use its deaths more effectively and remember them. Because, you know, I think we've all read a story where, or, or watched a story where we're like, oh, this is going to be one of those deaths that just gets moved on and forgotten, and then they don't. They continue to deal with it, dwell on it, and move on with it, and it's like, oh, I didn't realize how much I wanted this from this. That's what Full Metal Alchemist was for me and my wife when we she watched it and I read the manga and it was like well, yeah you have this death early on that it's like oh he died okay probably move on it's like no no everybody is going to be upset about this for the next 20 books like wow <laughs> cool like that's actually really nice I'm glad that even towards the end they still keep bringing up you killed Lieutenant Hughes it's like yeah I barely even remember him at this point but I'm glad the characters do yeah it's, it was a nice d demonstration of what can be done with that, that so many stories don't bother to do, and Star Wars usually doesn't bother to do. Um, Alderaan and Obi-Wan, like, Alderaan definitely gets forgotten by Leia there for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Obi-Wan's is pretty darn effective. Like, it is a it is an effective down moment, end of second act disaster problem, and I like it for that. That's good. Um, it's it's still good despite the fact that it basically gets into undone by having a ghost um star wars but star wars has never veered into full well the star wars movies oh no sorry i forgot about solo stupid solo <laughs> i was gonna say the, the star wars movies have never veered into full-on resurrection tropes and then i remembered darth maul showing up in solo uh. hate it um but until this point it's like yeah we had ghosts but they these ghosts are notably limited we never see any ghosts interact with any non-force receptive person and even then it's basically only luke mm -hmm. i mean 
do we ever see anyone but Luke interact with a Force ghost? Like, we, it's implied that Yoda has contacted Qui-Gon, but we don't see it. In the movies, we do not Yeah, see I know it. we do outside of the movies, yeah, but in the movies, in the I don't movies. think we ever do. Well, Not I even Ray has. I think Yoda's comments are firm enough that we would have to say yes. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure other people have. Like, I'm not questioning that. But we that. don't see it. But yeah, I just, I do. Yeah, I, I yeah. was just suddenly caught off guard by the realization that in the movies we have never seen anyone but Luke interact with a Force ghost. Yeah. Well, and we've only ever seen Obi Wan as a Force ghost. Oh no, that's, well, that's well, Obi Wan and Yoda with Yoda and, and Anakin. Uh, Yoda and Anakin at the end of Return of the Jedi, and then Yoda again in Episode Eight. Yeah. But yeah. Maybe Crazy. Some, oh. I'm sure we'll see Ray interact with some force, or maybe Kylo. I, I really, I really just want Luke to haunt Kylo in Episode <laughs> Nine. Like, just keep showing up, and Kylo will be like, "Go away!" And he's like, "Nope, I'm dead. What are you gonna do, sucker? <laughs> Stab me again?" <laughs> just oh wait, you didn't do time. it last time. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, so despite the fact that Obi-Wan does come back, it's still car- his death still carries some weight because he hasn't fully come back. Like, mm-hmm. he has a limited ability to interact with the world. He is still clearly, and he's never coming back oh. for real. No, we do have one interaction between Yoda and Obi-Wan as Luke is leaving. Oh, that's right, we do. Obi-Wan sticks there we around. Go. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Solid. Thanks, Ross. There we go. Good. Took me a minute, but we got there. All right, so it's nice to have that moment to know that these aren't just figments of Luke's imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Yoda was Unless always Yoda a figment. Well, I mean, <laughs> even before he died. Has anyone else ever met Yoda? Post not anyone living. <laughs> yeah, maybe Yoda got killed by the Emperor, guys. Holy! Well, he does ride on Luke's. Well, but if Luke's schizophrenic enough, like if it's it's if it's yeah. a vivid enough illusion. Maybe. Whoa, guys, guys, <laughs> new fan theory. <laughs> we got the sixth sense here. I like this one still better than most. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then Tarkin's death at the end is not a poorly done villain dies at the end. Like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Vader survives, which allows us to carry on the threat. And Tarkin gives us the, like, the... It's a bit predictable in the sense of like, yeah, villain has to die in order for the bad guys to win. I don't mind it here because, I mean, it works. Mm-hmm. That's my problem with Krennic in Rogue One is that it's like, no, he's only here so that we can do that because we, we don't dare have a story where the villain doesn't die. And that that bothers me. But Tarkin dying at the end is basically part of the, good job, heroes, you achieved it, here's your reward, Tarkin's dead. Yeah. Which is a morbid reward, but... Um, Dax is largely just a stakes raiser like it's just like oh somebody died oh no Luke almost died now it's going to be more difficult we can't use our gun it's not poorly done as far as those go Yeah, it's not spectacular it's there um, the Rancor we've already mentioned is surprisingly surprisingly tender Boba's largely inconsequential sadly yes Jabba is more consequential. Like it's, it is a definitely a payoff. Yeah, I was just gonna yeah, say it's a good a, payoff with his death. Yeah, I, I didn't really even delve into deaths as payoffs. So that this is definitely a thing. Death can be a payoff. This here's your reward, hero. You get to kill the bad guy. Yay! Rid the world <laughs> of someone you hate, or you know that deserves to die, <laughs> because hate is the path to the dark side. <laughs> I mean, um, uh... <laughs> Yoda who dies because his mentor service has been fulfilled and oh, except day. that he was already de- dead so this is just Luke <laughs> acknowledging that he doesn't need to be here anymore <laughs> this, is, this is Luke finally recovering this from is his Luke mental illness. yeah this yes. is Luke let no this is, this he's, is still, he's still he's still got the mental stage. illness they still show up at the end oh, of that's the, right that's right <laughs> this is just this is just Luke the only reason he's been holding on to the idea of Yoda being alive is because he needs to become a Jedi and Yoda needs to be the one to do that so once Yoda tells him, now you're there, you just need to go deal with Vader, then he doesn't need Yoda anymore, and Yoda fades away. Literally just disappears. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love this so much. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the Yoda's death is not ineffective. And in the, I think the most effective thing about Yoda's death is it removes the possibility of help for Luke, basically. It's like, Luke is now officially on his own. Like, he has his friends and everything, but he is the one responsible for dealing with the problem now. He does not have Obi-Wan to help him. He does not have Yoda. He's the last. 
And there is another Skywalker, but she's not consequential to these movies, so... You know, and the first time Luke sees a Force ghost, he's been battered and beaten by a Wampa, mm-hmm. he's suffering from exposure. Mm-hmm. I think there's mm-hmm. a real, mm-hmm. real possibility yeah. here. <laughs> Luke uh, broke down how to mental why, breakdown in the Wampa game. That's why Yoda and Obi-Wan... Uh, have their talk is this is just Luke's delusions yeah. like, this is all in Luke's head and there's like wait did they say there's another not just mentally blocking that out that's just him <laughs> coping with his grief over losing the girl to the other guy it's like <laughs> oh she's my sister I can't have her anyway that makes me feel better about not getting her it's not that she chose someone else she couldn't choose me yeah it's that she couldn't choose me there you go wow <laughs> oh man this keeps getting worse yeah, Star Wars become <laughs> the a evidence is story. piling up <laughs> so you could even say though maybe this is his madness at having seen his aunt and uncle crispified Ooh, maybe. the whole thing there was never any battle station uh that's a bit much it's Luke and Han- like everybody sees the battle station but all of the important- is he really uh, he'd have to be imagining this entire but think he meets, he meets Han and Chewie after seeing that. The only person that's still grounded he is met, Ben. He met Ben before that, though, and Ben interacts with Han and Chewie more than he does. Maybe he never actually went to Mos Eisley. Uh... So this is all a big dream. He's going to wake up and have to go clean moisture evaporators. No, he's going to wake up dying next to his aunt and uncle's burned corpse. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I think wow. we can safely say the rebellion does exist. The Death Star did exist, and Luke. Well, that would explain why nobody was concerned about the uh, huge loss of life that the de- destruction of the Death Star represented. Yeah. Uh, uh, or the fact that the- this is even worse than the Death Star was an inside job conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so then we have the Ewok death. We have Daddy McStuffykins. Um. That one's pretty darn effective, right? Yeah. Everybody, yeah. That's you know we've all we've all discussed. That if they kill one of these, they make we watch one of these Ewoks die. It's gonna be horrible. And then they did. Then they did. And yeah, it was pretty brutal. Yeah. And it's all because of his friend. Yeah. Yeah. His friend. It's because his friend's reaction. It's yeah. because this death has weight, and we get to see it have weight, like we don't with the racer. We never see anyone grieving over the racers, so it's never really real because we yeah. all know that that is the most real consequence of death for everyone People who survives. Mean is grief mm-hmm. and pain and all that and so when we see his friend reacting and realizing it's real and his friend is dead it hits, it hits. hard yep. not just because they're cute little teddy bears going through this but that doesn't hurt well I mean it does hurt it hurts hard but it does not hurt the effectiveness of the scene and again that's a stakes raising it's like we're showing creatures that we care about dying um we don't hugely worry about the others, but it does raise it. It's not quite wash levels of third act, oh my gosh, yeah. people can die, yeah. but it does establish that, hey, this is happening. Like, this is scary. And then we have the Emperor, who is kind of, you know, it's like, all right, yeah, this is the final obstacle. We're overcoming and he dies. Congratulations, cool. heroes. Yeah. yeah, and, and well, congratulations, heroes, and also, yay, redemption for Vader. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a differently done than your sta- especially at the time than your standard end of the story villain death yeah and so that's nice about it and then we get Vader's redemption equals death because there's no way we can actually reintegrate Vader into any sort of society at this point and we don't have time to factor that into this movie anyway mm-hmm. so as opposed to that awful Star Wars Infinities comic where he survives and turns to the light side to oh, save yeah. his, his kids armor. and then shows up in white armor and it's like yeah sure I'm sure the Rebellion and the New Republic are just going to be so thrilled with Vader just walking around. I'm a good guy now. See, I'm dressed in white. Obviously, (laughs) no one evil has ever dressed all in white with white masks. (laughs) <laughs> man Chris going political in this episode Dang. we don't even have to go political look at the Star Wars universe yeah. the stormtroopers all dressed in white also I don't feel masks. like it's overly political to say like the yeah. KKK is bad yeah. right? we, no, no our podcast here. is willing to take that difficult stance <laughs> the KKK is bad yeah I don't think we're going to experience too much pushback from that Yeah, and if we do well you're welcome to You're not You're welcome listen. to not listen, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so racers, largely inconsequential. We've really, we've pretty much gone through that. Qui-Gon. 
I feel like is not the most effective mentor death ever done. Like, it is some grief at the end where it's like, oh no, there's a consequence to us winning here, which is good to have. Like, that is good to have some consequence to this win because otherwise it is entirely without any consequence. Um, I mean, there's not even, like, I mean, we lose some Nemoidians, I guess that's about it. And some Gungans, <laughs> but nobody misses any Gungans not being around. Um, so not even the other Gungans if we're talking about Jar Jar. Yeah. I've already gotten rid of him once. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, so it's good to have some consequences at the end. So that is an effective use of death in that sense. As far as meaningful to characters, I mean, it does motivate Obi-Wan to be like, no, I am going to... I am going to take him on as an apprentice because it was Qui-Gon's wish. That's okay. It would be better if it weren't for the fact that motivations in the prequel trilogy are just all over the place, flippy floppy yeah. all the time. So it, it's hard to argue that any of these are really effective as motivational tools. Um, but, you know, not without consequence. That's good. Um, and Darth Maul is, you know, kind of a end of the movie villain gets beaten it's, even when it's like afterwards we realized we really should have kept him around because he was really handy like, <laughs> he should have been our Vader getting knocked in a ship spinning off and we didn't do that and well crap not even the inestimable Christopher Lee can quite carry that much menace yeah but so that that is a less consequential death where it's just like eh yeah he dies because this is where he dies cool you know, I guess it's an obstacle in the sense that now we don't get to interrogate him and find out. Are you really Sith? Are there more Sith? Yeah. Always two there are. But, uh, Zam Wessel, eh. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obstacle for them to overcome. Uh, Shmi. Shmi Skywalker. Not an inconsequential death, like both within the larger framework and as far as impact it has on the audience and the characters. But not as much punch as it should have, I think. I yeah. agree, yeah. Um, I feel like they could have done a lot better to show us more of Shmi. Um, yeah. Like, I don't think it would have been that bad to have her just, like, calling Coruscant to check in on her son. Like, yeah, for reals. Like, especially because, like, maybe if he's doing it behind the Jedi Order's back, he's not supposed to be doing this because it's emotional attachment and he's doing it anyway. Yeah. It's Anakin. We can have him do that. Yeah, that's literally his shtick. <laughs> yeah, that's and it's and it's... It's not like it would be out of place in this movie that builds up to him slaughtering an entire village because they killed his mother. Like, if we have him going behind people's back, we can establish that he's not supposed to be doing this. This emotional attachment has some negative connotations here, and it leads it to It would have made his fall to the dark side a lot more real, I think, mm -hmm. and impactful itself. Yeah. If... As far as the choice goes to kill her in that manner, that's a solid storytelling choice, yeah. but it definitely could have been set up and used more effectively. Um... I will I will say though that they do as far as hitting the right notes as far as consistency goes like he brings her back like we get to see him mourn over her and her death continues to have consequence especially once we get to episode 3 and we see him having visually similar dreams about Padme as he had of his his mother and we can instantly make the connection that he's afraid of this happening again like it resonates through the entire trilogy so that's nice um just could have been done better um, the monsters in the arena, which again, it's like, yeah, these are obstacles. Like, hey, good job, heroes. You get to kill the things now. Mm -hmm. And you get to take them down. Django is kind of a weird mix of that, where it's like, oh, yep, he gets taken out now because it's the end of the movie. And a, oh, look what we're setting up. We'll get the reference. Now Boba's going to become a bad guy because his dad got killed. Not I that he wouldn't have become guys. a bad guy when he was being raised by a morally dubious bad guy anyway. Yeah. Uh, but sure, okay. That's motivation, I guess. We care. But I mean, funk. <laughs> 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 but, but that is just a little bit of a moment. Seeing it, it's not a bad I mean, moment. Yeah. That that moment as a self-contained moment, pretty solid. Yeah, I'll, I'll allow that, definitely. For uh, um, Boba's reaction to his father's death is real. It mm -hmm. just doesn't matter except as ooh look it's a setup for something from the other movies sort of that didn't really need a setup and it's like if it had a consequence if he showed up in episode 3 you know it would only be 3 years later so that wouldn't have worked that well but hey we could have fiddled with that time whatevs 
but if he yeah if he had showed up again within this trilogy then it would have been more meaningful where it's like oh okay this has an, a meaningful impact as it is it's more just hey here have some have some uh, easter eggs yeah. nerds um Dooku's death I don't know how I feel about Dooku's death like on the one hand I like how unexpected it was that it was like hey very beginning we're not even we're barely into the first act this is just the opening action and we're killing off Dooku it's like oh yeah oh I did not see that coming so th- I always appreciate that if you can if you can catch me off guard I appreciate that yeah. more often than not like there, there's you know there's a spectrum there jump scares just get annoying but yeah but yeah if you can catch me off guard with something I didn't see coming then that's nice um and it has some meaning like this is kind of showing that you know Palpatine is officially moving into post Dooku stages like we're <laughs> he's in his endgame as far as corrupting Anakin here so that's nice and shows that Anakin has the moral complexity of a two year old <laughs> I shouldn't kill him do it okay I shouldn't have done that okay I mean I had so okay here's a little story for for just a reference for how bad that that particular scene works on that front my wife uh, made some pasta last night and it was just kind of her tossing stuff in a pot and going like yeah this this would taste good together right we'll see how it works and in our marriage nine times out of ten that she has done that it does work out more than nine times out of ten, and uh, eleven times she came out and of picked 10. me up from work. Yes, she came and picked me up from work, and she's like, "Yeah, dinner didn't turn out." It's, and I was like, "You always say that. It'll be fine." And I got in there and I tried some, and I went, eh, "Yeah, okay, that's weird." So pizza tonight, right? Yeah, no. I, I, I well, what I started doing is, is like, I feel like this needs something. Like it's weirdly ranchy in its flavor, which I hate ranch, so that wasn't good. But I was like. I feel like I can doctor this into something that'll taste all right. And so I added some spices and I was like, mm, no, no. Added something else. I was like, mm, no, no. And I'm getting into the area where there's, there's just too much here. Like, I, I basically, I've got to go big or go home. Bre- let's break out the Tabasco sauce. <laughs> put that in there. And she's, and that was the first thing I thought to put in was Tabasco. And I was like, no, that would not work with this flavor profile at all. But then I was like, well, we'll go for broke. We'll give it a shot. Mixed it up. And I tried it and I was like, I should not have done that. I should not. That this is this is officially crossed the line from. Well, that tastes weird. To, I Inevitable. might vomit. Like this is Ugh. bad. And I was. But that's the thing is. So my pasta, my adding Tabasco to my pasta, had more emotional consequences for me than Anakin <laughs> killing Dooku. <laughs> like I was sitting there like, oh god, oh I should not have done that. I have made a mistake. I have. Oh, oh god. And Anakin's just like, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, not not well done. Not well done as far as emotional consequences at all, as far as meaning to the story, really. Like, no one really comments on, like, yes! Dooku is dead! It's just sort of like, oh, Dooku's dead, now we need to get Grievous. Like, mm. yeah. Not not well used yeah. to death. Grievous's death, also kind of, eh, you know. Um, one thing I will say with Dooku's death, though, is doesn't that also give a little bit of motivation to um, Anakin saving Palpatine later? Because you essentially have the same situation, and now Anakin, you can kind of see he has a a, a way to kind of redeem, not redeem, but even like mm. correct his mistake before. If it had ever come up again, I would say yeah. But if you know, if Anakin had had a moment in the movie where he's just like, where he's clearly dealing with grief over like, I should not have done that. That was not the right thing to yeah. do. And then, and so that we could set up a parallel to Mace Window doing that, and Anakin being like, No, no, I've gone through this once. It was the wrong thing then. It's the wrong thing now. Yeah, that would work. But as it is, it's it's done, it's forgotten, never brought up again, and so it's not really an effective parallel, I would say. Well, but the th- but a lot of the dialogue is the same. Uh, uh, he's too dangerous to be kept alive. That's something that's said by uh, both the Emperor in the first and Mace Windu in the second. Um, Anakin talks about how he needs to stand trial in both cases. Yeah, I mean, so the, yeah, there's definitely a parallel so. there. You're right. Like that's pretty clear. But it's it's just not effectively done. I would say. Yeah. Like it's there. Uh, with you pointing out that I would say yeah you're totally right that was probably their intention to set that up they just didn't didn't set it up properly yeah it's yeah it's not really because it had no emotional weight to him you know it's just Mm -hmm. like oh I killed a guy bummer not even that oh I killed a guy guess I shouldn't have 
Anyway, yeah. let's not bring this up for another two hours and then have a scene that mirrors this and you know, it doesn't work. But but that is a good point, yeah. They definitely did were trying to do that. So good catch. Um Grievous' death is just you know, it's there. Obstacle overcome. Obstacle. Good job, Obi Wan. Um Even though it was so uncivilized. It was very uncivilized. Um and then we have the Jedi. So this is one of those of I would say mixed effectiveness. Where it, it it's kind of like um it's kinda of like uh Chiruts walking across the sand for me where I was like that moment is emotionally effective of oh my gosh look he's doing this and everything but I think it's largely effective as a self-contained thing with the music and proper dramatic cues and framing yeah. all setting this up as look how dramatic this moment is because you know once I st- stepped back and thought about it I was like that was literally the least impressive thing he's done this whole movie like why that doesn't really work it doesn't make sense why couldn't he just do this and and the, the Jedi are a similar thing not in that it's like most of these Jedi, we don't really know. Like, yeah, we can recognize Kiati Mundi, but most most of the moviegoers don't know who he is. Mm-hmm. The other Jedi are just completely unfamiliar to most of the viewers. But it does have some emotional weight and resonance. You know, like, it's it's well framed. Well, sh- with the music is is really effective. Yeah, just John really Williams is. pulling out mm-hmm. all the stops to m- remind us all that this matters. Well, and you also get Yoda's reactions. And you get Yoda's reactions. Yeah. yeah. And so I would say all of those combined to make this far more consequential than you would expect a bunch of basically unrecognizable mm-hmm. characters' deaths to be. Like, and and within a larger framework when we can rely on the fact that we know that this is the end of the Jedi Order, effectively. Like, we know what's happening here. This is it. That definitely helps lend it some weight. And so I would argue that, yeah, not badly done, all in all. Not their best. Well, I mean, I mean pretty... It could have been done better theoretically, like, if we had taken time to get to know more of these Jedi, and then we saw them brutally destroyed one by one, mm. and maybe if we, we really pushed as, if this is going to be the first Star Wars movie rated PG-13, why not just push it into a little more visceral territory? <laughs> well, that's why I think I like the Clone Wars so much, is you do get to know these Jedi, yeah, and then and that definitely you watch episode scene. three, and it's kind of like, oh, man. Yeah. Like, it was cool. Like, I've watched you and Bly do missions together. Yeah. And now he's gunning you down under a flower. Yeah. See, and I, I would compare it to, like, well, I mean, I mean, just at least in the visuals of it, like I was talking with um, Stranger Things Season 2, so here's some spoilers for that. Um, Sean Astin's death in that, mm-hmm. where part of what makes that so effective is that they do not flinch away. Like, the camera does not cut. Yeah. You see him torn down, and then you yeah. see him just, like, torn bitten into. and torn yeah. to pieces, and it's it's grotesque, like, it, and it's visceral, and just, like, oh, this is painful and horrible. And so when season three starts and Joyce is still having nightmares about this and having trouble moving on from this and everything, it's like, yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. It's been longer for me than you and I'm still not over it and I wasn't <laughs> dating the man. Like, dang. <laughs> dang, that's effective. Yeah, so, whereas I would argue that some of the deaths at the end of season three, mm, not quite as effective despite one of them I feel them like that... I need to watch Stranger Things yes you do it's pretty solid yeah I, I like Stranger Things it's but... a shame you haven't but yeah I tried watching a couple episodes and it just but hey gruesome death though that'll get me in there yeah that's if you want if you want to watch uh, Samwise Gamgee get brutally murdered then well and <laughs> if if gore is your thing season 3 is for you oh yeah season 3 has some solid body horror I saw like body rats horror. exploding yeah. and stuff you have what I saw like rats exploding yes and stuff. yes yep. And then people, people melting. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it's it gets pretty. Yeah, pretty body horror. Ugh. Um, but yeah. Um, so that's what it's like with. I don't necessarily want rated R deaths by any means here. I don't want Stranger Things level of holy crap, not Samwise. Um, <laughs> but but I do think if they had flinched back a little less, instead of having Elisakura fall underneath the tent of this fungus and so we don't actually see it show us show us her die i mean we've seen yeah. we've seen deaths Kiyabi Mundi. well i wonder if it's because it's a woman because we see plo Koon get blown up we see Kiyabi Mundi yeah. get gunned well down. generally though yeah. most deaths in star wars either we don't actually see the killing blow most of the time or it's in you know it's obscured in an explosion uh that's not universal just most Qui-Gon, we don't actually see the killing blow. 
we, we see it come out his back. We see it out of his back afterwards, but we don't we see don't it go see it, through. We don't see it land. We don't actually see the blow land. Same thing with Obi Wan cutting Darth Maul in half. We get Darth Maul's face, face when that happens, yeah. and a little red mist. Yeah, which I love. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, but we don't actually see the blow land, and that happens most of the time. The, I think the biggest exception is Luke losing his hand, where yeah. we do actually see yeah. it get lopped off. And but I wonder, Dooku's head is like walking right in there where it is kind of obscured on screen, but it, you do see it. Yeah. I, I wonder in the case of Aayla Sakura specifically, though, um, the one thing that got me about that scene as a kid was that they kept shooting her. I don't yeah. remember them doing that to uh, Kiari Mundi. Yeah, we don't see that with Kiari Mundi. He takes, you know, a dozen or. We do see Kiati Mundi get hit. Right. It's not and very. Then he falls, but and as he falls, he's on the ground, they don't keep shooting him like they did with her. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like, and we I don't. Mean, and that one, could be a valid reason to cut away. That was. Yeah. We, we, I mean, without in particular, I was kind of glad for that flowery fungus thing. Cause, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. fair. I wouldn't, but I wouldn't have minded like a shot or two of just Kiati Mundi laying in the snow, like mm-hmm. he's dead. Like that's a. That it can be yeah. very effective just to linger on death for a moment. Instead of jumping on, which they did end up doing with all. I'm of just the disappointed we didn't get to see him butcher younglings. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Because you did, you had that one shot after Anakin is done, of they just kind of go back around the room, where and you see all uh, these dead. Separatist okay, I leaders. don't remember that, but but see, and that for me, I'm like, that's the wrong place to use that. We don't. Nobody cares about the separatist leaders yeah. dying. They're yeah, they're basically they're dead. those are basically yeah. Nazi deaths. Like, yes, okay, we've overcome these bad guys. Especially only it's the bad by guys the end of episode it. three, they very much are Nazi deaths. I mean, the yeah, well, they they haven't been consequential to yeah, this plot at exactly. all. Exactly. And the place to linger would have been the Jedi deaths. Yeah. Like, and the youngling deaths. Hey, youngling deaths. Not the youngling deaths. <laughs> no. no. Star Wars could not have. Yeah, they could not, not have quite managed that. Are. The closest they could do to that was the teenager that gets shot down yeah. in front of Bail Organa. Yeah. Um, and even that was for Star Wars. There's a reason this one got the PG-13 for the first time, yeah. but, yeah. um, that and watching a guy burn. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> oh, you meant the movie. You oh the movie. yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> you knew my father. Yes. Yeah, remarkable man. Flammable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, yeah, we couldn't show the younglings and that that we've discussed before that yeah. scene pretty mm-hmm. strong like yep. that's a pretty solid yep. even even with that kid's mediocre acting that is some and and wisely we cut down on Hayden Christensen's acting we just have him glowering which he's pretty good at so mm-hmm. yeah and he I would actually say Hayden Christensen knocked that little moment out of the park where it's like you see that it's like this is not simply a oh these don't matter and I've you know it's a, it's very much a yep I'm gonna do this yep. it has to be done I, I, props to him on that moment. So I'd say that scene's pretty darn effective. Possibly one of the most effective deaths, and it's not even shown in the entire series. Well, and yeah, I remember in the theater seeing it the first time, going, "Well, you're done." Because I mean, you, you like Anakin up till this yeah. point, yeah. right? At this point, you're just like, Mm-mm, "Nope, mm-hmm. not my favorite." Which anymore. Which is part of why I, it frustrates me that they put the separatist leaders after that, where it's like, and that's where we see his eyes go all glowy, yeah. and I'm like, "No, this is not." Like they, they, there is some stuff in some of the delete in the uh, behind the scenes stuff where they talk about well, like, oh yeah, this is the moment where Anakin's officially crossed the line of no return, and it's like, no, it's not. We all know it's not. Mm-hmm. The moment when he did that was when he willfully slaughtered children. Yeah, yeah. Screw these guys. These guys are warmongers. Like they deserve it. Um, and then there's Padme. The oh well, I'm not in the rest of the series. Guess I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> Which I actually have that meme on my phone. Like when you realize you're not in the the original movies. Yep. Guess I'll die. But that's basically Padme. Is like it's meant to be meaningful, and I mean it's not without some meaning. The funeral scene's nice, and it's it's nice as a consequence to Anakin's actions. Like he he doesn't get what he wanted. He did this mm-hmm. to save her. He doesn't get it because that's not how becoming a bad guy works. Ideally. Um, <laughs> you don't get what you want. But, um, so it is nice for all of those reasons. As far as the impact it should have had to kill off a main character who was beloved by the main, by the other main character and for whom saving her life was the most important thing, it should have been a lot more impactful. Yeah, And it really wasn't, particularly because there just wasn't a reason for it. Uh, she just, you know, lost the will to live. Yeah. 
as one does. Because Star Wars mothers don't care about their children. Except for maybe Shmi. <laughs> I was I was just thinking of Jyn Erso's mom, but Oh <laughs> well, I mean I think it, it sits it right there nice with all the rest of the Disney canon. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I mean, a lot of the Disney canon is like the mom dies because, you know, bad something bad happened. Like Anna and Elsa lose their parents because shipwreck. Oh, well, what can you do? Well, but and then the original parents decide that the next best person to take care of the child is yeah. is the wicked, quote unquote, titled family member, the yep. wicked stepmother, the Yep. But I mean like you know, Padme is like, "Hey, you just had two children to take like they depend on you." Mm, no, I've lost the will to live. They're not enough. Yeah. I don't care. Like, really? Over Anakin doll? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so, Finn's friend. Pretty dang effective. We discussed that. Mm-hmm. Like, raise it, it, it establishes it. I think the best thing about it for me is that it subverts our usual expectations with Star Wars. Like, we don't expect a stormtrooper death to matter, and it does here, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's different. It's okay that they've never mattered before because we're getting this scene from the perspective of a stormtrooper watching mm-hmm. his friend die. And it's nice to get an acknowledgement that, hey, these are people. It doesn't necessarily undermine the other movies to go, hey, let's acknowledge that these are people. Except that then we don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, which, you know, okay, you know, we're back to, back to the norm, but nice to have that moment either way. Yeah. And it's definitely an effective one. Like I said, I forgot about all the other people being slaughtered because of it. <laughs> and Han Solo. Yeah. This is an interesting one. Because more than any of the others, you have the weight of 40 years of expectations behind it. And this beloved character that we never thought we'd see on the screen again because Han- because Harrison Ford doesn't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and we all know about that. And here he is. Mm-hmm. And we all kind of knew going in that this was a distinct possibility because Harris- they convinced Harrison Ford to do this again. So probably he's I mean, dead. Was there anyone doubting that this was going to happen? Mm-hmm. Me? Yeah, some, yeah, I, Harrison I, Ford does not like Star Wars. Well, no, I, I know. I think doubting that he was going to die. Yeah. Oh, oh, doubting yeah, yeah, yeah. that he was going to die. Oh, yeah, no. Doubt- like, as soon as... Not necessarily expecting him to die in that manner. Like, I don't think anyone went into that movie going, you know, I bet Han Solo gets murdered by his own son in this movie. Yeah. Well, I Maybe did... a few people connected the dots of them saying that Kylo was the anti-Luke Skywalker, but... Well, oh, I didn't do that, but I remember the first time watching it as soon as... Like, as soon as Kylo Ren comes on, he's like, oh, you don't forget your parents. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be Han and Leia's kid. And then just a little bit later, I was like, oh, that's how Han is going to die. Yeah, pretty early on once they got that, I was like, oh, that doesn't bode well for Han. Yeah. But there was still some possibility. It was like, there's still different ways they could kill kill him and have it be thematically resonant. We'll see which one they go for. And see... And but then the further you get into that well, final action, the more it's like, well, uh, yep, we're running as, out of options other than kind of killing him. As soon as he steps out, though, and he's like, man, I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, here it is. You're a dead man walking. You yep. are. You got minutes left, buddy. But I was expecting a more characterly thematic death for him. Like because shoot so out? <laughs> when, no, <laughs> actually. Have him shoot first. <laughs> my, going into it, my money was on, you know, you're going to have Han, Chewie, in the Falcon. They die doing something awesome with, with those with three the together. With Falcon, yeah. You that know? Would up. Um Granted, that would have been a huge blow, killing off Han, Chewie, and the Falcon all at once. <laughs> um, which I can see that's probably why they didn't. But I've, a, a, had it been me... They're saving Chewie's death for episode nine. I know. <gasps> um, oh. I kind of want Chewie to just be the only one that survives. I, 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 honestly, <laughs> Chewie I is like, eternal. I feel like he's going to. He I feel might. like Chewie might actually... Chewie and the Falcon, I think, are going to make it. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I kind of uh, would just want Chewie, Chewie to join... Um, 3PO and R2 is just I show up all over in Star Wars just yeah. here, I'm here. there everywhere Cause so so Han's character has been very much you know you know the rogue the pilot and all of that so mm-hmm. you, you at least in, in my opinion in my unprofessional writing opinion you want the character to die showing those qualities right because that it's an appropriate right. death for him but in Force Awakens they kind of abandoned that they, he started off that way, but they make him the father through the rest like, of the movie. He, he has character development, I would say. Yeah. It's like it's, this is him stepping up and doing what he has never done, even though he knows it could lead to his yeah. death. And so it's 
Well, and but it, it becomes thematically appropriate because because they made it's him the father. yeah because it's yeah. character development and yep. him being something else, cho- consciously choosing to take a different path than he normally has. Makes mm-hmm. me really hope my kids never become protagonists because then my life oh, is yeah. in danger. Yeah, no, yeah, you never want protagonist <laughs> children. That is scary. Yeah. <laughs> even even being a protagonist parent is risky. Like if yeah. you are the parent and you are a protagonist, eh, yeah, that can be that can be tricky. Yeah. That can be gray area. No, I think didn't you, go well for Kratos. Yeah, you want to be the parents of extra number four, because yeah. both villain and protagonist parents have. Well, but extra, extra number record. four might not do too well either. Not if he becomes stormtrooper number four. But. That is well, true. but see, then you just have to deal with the loss of a child rather than the parent dying. Anyway, yeah, yeah, we digress. <laughs> okay, um, but yeah, Han, I would say. It's it's hard to divest the effectiveness of Han's death from the weight of the years of loving the character. Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh, doing my best to do that, I still feel like it's a pretty effectively done. Well, I think so. And but even again, as as we've just been saying, he is now the parent, and he dies probably you know performing yeah. the ultimate act of parenthood of till trying to love his son through exactly. trial. He we it, there's definitely significant meaning on his personal level here there's also thematic res- meaning in the movie where this is like we're specifically subverting the the story that we've seen before of redeeming the good guy we're mm-hmm. the bad guy we're not doing that here the bad guy is going to consciously choose to be badder and the the light closing off as it does that and everything it's all really really and well effect done on Ray, I mean. yep an effect on ray and not chewy though he's cool um <laughs> I mean, he doesn't need a hug or anything. He does shoot Kylo, so there's that. <laughs> yeah. He gets pissed off for a minute and then is like, well, I'm s- I was sad, but now I'm good. Or at least nobody cares about his pain. Yeah. He hides his pain behind a wall of fur. I'm sure he, he probably went to go visit with the other, you know, bounty hunters and scoundrels because they actually acknowledge him. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> it. I mean, it's really Beckett has acknowledged him. There's not many other people that have ever done that. Beckett and Voss. Oh, wait, both those guys died. Yeah, so he's, he's got, got nobody Chewie's left. Got nobody. Maybe that's why Chewie never gets close to people. <laughs> <laughs> the only people who acknowledge him die, and so he's just like, nope, standoffish, don't talk to me. And that's why nobody acknowledges him, is because it's him trying to save people's lives. <laughs> Anyone who gets close to him dies. We Man, have, fan, new fan yeah, theories left and right. We've had some great fan fiction in this episode. <laughs> Chewie's poor, tortured existence, keeping oh, people at, at, at arm's length because of the curse placed upon him as a child that yeah. anyone he gets close to will die. That's also why he leaves all the people in the Kessel, all the his people in the Kessel run at Kessel Mines is because like, no, no, if I go with you, you'll die. I'm going to go with this idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and then that idiot just proved to be lucky enough to stay alive. And he was like, maybe, maybe, maybe the time one. has come. And for years it was, he was happy. And then Kylo Ren came. <laughs> before the dark times. times before, before Kylo, Kylo Ren. Ren. And now he's hanging out with Ray. Well, sort of. He he's around Ray, but he's not really hanging with Ray. Yeah, it's not quite the same. We'll see. Not yet. Episode nine. Yeah. Ray's dead. Chewie lives. No. Nope. First continues. Ray and Ray and Chewie are in a relationship and they die together. That's oh. who Ray ends up with. <laughs> <laughs> you ever okay. been spooned by a Wookiee <laughs> or whatever. Uh so Page Page Tico's death. Uh, we discussed not very effective yeah. for you, Kyler. Yeah, pretty effective for me. I like it again, par- partly just because this is something Star Wars hasn't doesn't done before. We're going to focus in a pretty s- dramatic way on the fact that lives are being lost left and right here, mm-hmm. and you know it's like the the Death Star run in the first one is like yeah, lives are being lost left and right. Well, that ups the stakes. We got to try even harder, guys. And then afterwards, yay, we're all happy. None of those deaths have any consequence. Yeah, you know, we mourn Biggs briefly, and then we're done. And, and not that that was a bad choice there, but it is it is definitely a shift in a tone for Star Wars to go, hey, people are dying, and it was bad. Mm-hmm. And yep. it was like, they just like, they achieved their goal, and it really wasn't worth it. Like, sometimes that's not a good choice. I like that. Um, and I, I... I definitely had trouble connecting Rose's grief to Paige. And, uh... So that it could have been more effective for me, but... I do like having that. Akbar at all, meh. Yeah. This is, this is mainly this is mainly a dramatic moment because we think Leia's dying, mm-hmm. and then she doesn't, and so. Well, and they they didn't point out exactly who was dying in this scene. Again, you you see Akbar yeah. kind of in the background, you know. Yeah. 
Well, and, and part of the reason for that is because the purpose of this scene is setting up the threat to Leia and yeah. and also removing Leia from the plot for a while so that we can have our whole mutiny and all that. Uh, and giving Kylo a moment to pause. And yeah, and showing Kylo so. pause. Like, it's serving a lot of story purposes. Lingering on the deaths of the higher resistance leaders was not the point of the story here. Yeah. So I don't necessarily fault them for choosing not to. But come on, Akbar deserved better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, and really, it's it's kind of like Boba Fett. It's like, he wasn't really hugely consequential. Like, he, he's not consequential to this movie. He wasn't to the last one. Like, there's no... It would have been a bad choice to focus on Akbar's death, too. They just shouldn't have put Akbar there at all. <laughs> <laughs> Snoke. Now, this one is also very divisive for a lot of people. A lot of people that are just like, oh, you, they killed him off halfway through. They're, they're just being unpredictable for unpredictability's sake. It has no point. I obviously vehemently disagree with that assessment. I can understand why people are there. Like, it's... Especially when people are coming to this going, like, yeah, this is this is more comforting food. This is like, I know what is going to happen. I want to see the big climactic battle. That's going to be cool. And instead, he just dies. And I get how that's a letdown for a lot of people. Me, I love it. Obviously. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary on that one. But for me, it's it was a nice version of, we know when this guy is supposed to die, and then we did it differently, and... Well, dang, that caught me off guard, and that hit. Praetorian guards are just Nazis. Most of the resistance, I feel like, manages to do a pretty good job of killing off faceless characters, but having it be meaningful, like, frightening. Personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Phasma. I mean, the, the whole fact that we have that question mark there, I think, would indicate that that wasn't that effective of a moment. Well, but the thing is, is, is we shouldn't have a question mark. She fell into a fiery pit. Yeah. Right? from a, a great height on a ship that had just been blasted yeah. and there's it's, it is effectively debris floating in space however she was also left in a garbage disposal on a planet that then got tossed into the sun basically like we we tossed her into the garbage chute and, and then we tossed Maul that got garbage chute completely shoot. cut in half she only yeah. got her face yeah. smashed a little bit Darth Maul got completely cut in half and fell down a bottomless pit yeah. and lived so but it's, it's one of those where it's like I put we, we, we put her in a garbage chute and then we blew the garbage chute up and here she is. Here she is. And I'm okay with that, honestly. I just think it's funny at this point. I'm just like, yeah, sure. I, I kind of want her to be in episode nine just for the amusement of she's still here. <laughs> <laughs> but see, okay, so here's the thing, though, is that in she's when a they cockroach. put her in a, a garbage compactor, they, we didn't see it. Right. Well, I'm, we assume they did because there wasn't any. Yeah. Well, well and, and the, the Phasma comic does confirm that. Uh -huh. Yes, they yeah. did put her there. Um, but also, it's easy enough in the mind of the viewer without any other comics or anything to be like, oh, well, they could have got her out quick enough. We didn't know? see the death. Right. So we, it might not have happened. And because so I mean, in it's, 9, it's, she's going to show up and they're going to have to kill her death. No, in it's, 9, she just has to show up and have scarring. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's plausible enough that she could survive the trash compactor, right? Yeah. The falling down a flaming bit of broken ship is a lot harder to understand, even though yep, yep. people do do it in other type movies and exactly. things, but still. It would, no, I we, agree it would be ludicrous. She should be dead. Well, and I kind of don't want her to <laughs> because I think it would be awesome. With Chris okay. on this. Mentally, <laughs> mentally, I'm with you guys. I feel, still feel like she's going to show up, but even though there's nothing in my brain that I can resolve to say that she's alive, I still feel like she's going to. Yeah. It seems like so. a high probability thing. Well, remember, the ship she's on isn't destroyed. But they were a lot closer right. to the damage than anything well, else I, on the ship. Yeah, but... Yeah. Uh, I think the main reason we all feel this way is because it was, like, she was a cool-looking character who got underutilized in the first movie and then tossed in a trash compactor, and it was like, well, that was anticlimactic. And then she just showed up, no explanation given in the movie. Yeah. She's just there in The Last Jedi, and it's like, oh, really? Oh, okay. So she's here. She is going to have more weight. Nope, she's just here to have a fight and then get beat again. And it's like, wait, what? And I kind of feel like the best way to resolve that appropriately is to do it one more time. Yes. Just have her show up. No explanation. Three. She just has some scarring. Maybe not even that. Kind of want her to still be wearing that helmet, but you can see an eye patch in the gap. They build an eye patch into the helmet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And then, and then just have her show up, no explanation, get beat one more time, pretty anticlimactically, and then we're done with her. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I think that would be hilarious. Ah, <laughs> oh, I want it. I want it badly. Please, JJ. All right. And Luke. Yes. So, Luke's. 
I mean, I feel like it's a pretty impactful death, whether you like it or not. It is impactful. It's thematic. Very much so. Um, I was even thinking about that today, actually, before we... Yeah, recorded. it's definitely bittersweet. It's This is the kind of bitter death. Oh, I forgot to mention, Beth, death can also be peaceful. Mm-hmm. Death can be peaceful in movies. It can be a release. I, there are definitely stories where it's like, oh, someone dies, and that's okay. They've earned that, you know? Um, so I forgot to mention that. Because that's definitely a real life thing. Like, you know, by the time my father's mother passed away, it was she it was long overdue. It was mm-hmm. a release. Like she was so far sunk into Alzheimer's that there was no way to even hold a meaningful conversation in any way or even just interact meaningfully. And it had been that way for a while. <laughs> they they took her off of all they like she was so close to death that they're just like, you know what, we're not gonna give her a medication anymore. There's no point in prolonging this. We're just taking all her meds away, we're taking all that away and just gonna let her go peacefully. Yeah. She lasted like six months after that. Oh, jeez. This was, and this was all two and a half years after her doctor signed off that she had six months to live and she got put on hospice. But Man. The woman, that is my grandmother. Wow. The woman would not die just out of spite. <laughs> and I love her. And I, but, it, but it was a peaceful thing. And so that can definitely be a factor that we haven't really been acknowledging. And I kind of feel like Luke is walking this weird line between like, there is some peace to it. And some resolution and some, like, yeah, this is good. But it's also, like, this bittersweet of, like, no, Luke's gone. He just got to... It's almost a redemption equals death. Now that I think about it, it's like he's been off the path and he's he's finally stepping up and is like, no, I'm going to make this better. I'm, you know, it's like he's flat out telling Kylo Ren, like, I'll be here for you. Yeah. And then he dies. And it's funny, though, because I thought it was a great death, very... I mean, almost poetic with how they, they kind of bookended yeah. Luke's story. Oh, I do love that. Um, and that was the thing I, I realized this morning is that, so Luke's story starts with Luke looking off into the sunsets, right? Uh, ends the same way with that song. Uh, but but also, the the two scenes are mirrored yep. each other. In the first scene, Luke is on the left side of the screen looking Facing to the right. right. Yep. In the last one, he's on the right side of the screen looking left. You know, yep. So it literally, it bookends the entire saga yes sir so yep and i do like it and and it serves a similar purpose for ray's story as yoda's death did for luke's mm-hmm. it's like okay now this is on you luke's still gonna be around helping we know that he's gonna be force ghosting it and i really want to see him interacting with making good on his promise to kylo ren that he's gonna be here um not just as a hilarious haunting but just like <laughs> really he said that and now he needs to carry through on that if if the actions of the last movie are gonna have any weight um, so he's not gone, but it is very much like, okay, he's out. Like, he's he's here for support, but that's all. This is on your shoulders now, Ray and everybody else. So that's good. So like, all in all, I'm very happy with that one. So yeah. But it did take me a bit to get there. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, would you would you say it was an effective death? I would argue yes. I have to be careful with The Last Jedi because I know I have a tendency with The Last Jedi to want it to be good because I've argued so much with people who don't want it to be good. Mm-hmm. And and I've had so many scenarios where I'm like talking to people and they're like, like, it doesn't work because this doesn't work. It's like, yeah, it does though. Here, let me outline that for you. See how it works. No. <laughs> and obviously the only reason I'm saying no is because I don't want it to be true. And so I don't want to do the opposite. So I, 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 get, I get cagey about The Last Jedi when it's like, I feel like it's done well, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, I I was caught off guard by it at the end and was like, wait, no, what? I don't... Uh, 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 but the more, the further I've gotten from it, the more I'm like, no. No, that was appropriate there. Like, this is, this is Luke sacrificing his life to save people that matter to him. Which is kind of the opposite of what had to happen to Anakin. Like, Anakin... Anakin's problem was that he had all these emotional attachments and he was willing to cross lines to save them. And he did, and he fell to the dark side. Every time Luke has flirted with the dark side, has had moments of difficulty, has been con- because of concern over people he loves. And and so to have Luke step up and sacrifice his own life to save people is like the exact opposite of what Anakin was doing. It was him going, okay, I will put myself on the line. That's That's the light side approach to that. It's like you can have emotional attachments, you just make them kill you instead of them, like, instead of <laughs> others. Like... You know, it's 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 a better approach to take, and I like that thematically a lot. And and I love, like you said, the visual book ending of all of it, the the uh, audio book ending, everything about that is just gorgeous. I love it. So, all in all, I give it thumbs up. 
So, anthology movies have plenty of deaths too. I mean, but they they all basically fall into similar categories. Like some of the Rogue One ones are more effective, some are less. And I, I mean, we've been through most of those. So, mm-hmm. all in all, I feel like Star Wars is kind of middle of the road when it comes to how it uses its deaths. There are some pretty so- like usually how it's using them is at least well thought out. Like they know why they're killing a character and they kill them. Generally speaking, they serve that purpose. Whether or not it could have served more purposes, could have been more effective, I think is often... They often fall short of what they could have done with them, but they're at least hitting what they want most of the time, if it's not the prequels. Um, (laughs) And the prequels are more hit or miss, but obviously the prequels are more hit or miss on everything. So so, so I I don't know. Mainly, I guess, when when I got... When I got uh, planning this out, I was like, okay, so what do I want from Star Wars in the future? And it's just like, really, I would like to see more more meaningful, wide-arching deaths. I want to see death have more consequence in Star Wars. I don't know if they should do that, because I feel like that could potentially be a drastic tonal shift for Star Wars. Yeah. And at the very least, maybe not in Episode Nine, and we can have someone else do that in their own, you know, it's like... Benny and Weiss. Yeah, D&D could do it. Ryan Johnson definitely could do that, and... So there's definitely potential down the road for Star Wars t- for us to get to see this in Star Wars, and I would enjoy that. I don't necessarily, ne- I don't necessarily fault the main series though for not delving into that area. Mm-hmm. Like Rogue One's kind of pushing for that in some ways and undermines it in other ways, but it's like, yeah, that's definitely a shift in where we're willing to go with the big screen. Um, personally, I'd like to see more of that though. Yeah. So that's the point. I'd love to see more meaningful death in Star Wars and really see it used effectively. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I think that was about as thorough as you can go for the mainline movies yeah. and, <laughs> and their and deaths. I like to know that my favorite deaths came out okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I was concerned when I was making this list. I was like, well, I hope I don't step on any toes here. Yeah, and I, I have done that before, where people, where I was like, "Oh yeah, that death scene just knew," and people are like, "Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry." It's just like I cried for weeks after that. <laughs> I made a pillow out of them that made that look like them, so that I could cuddle it to get over it. And it's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. This You're is weak. one of those deaths that <laughs> was real for you. You know, this was your Iron Man death." And sorry, I didn't mean to step on that. But uh, thanks, Chris, for. Why well, my pleasure? Us. You know, I'm always and, happy to engage uh, in our our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, you don't need to thank me. This <laughs> was like you know, this was kind of your episode. Well, and, thank you. I appreciate so, your thanks. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at More Civilized, and join our Facebook group More Civilized Podcast. That both of those things allow us to interact with you, the listeners, a lot more, which we enjoy. We enjoy getting to know you guys, mm-hmm. so please do that. And. This week, in particular, oh, hey. on that note, by the way, all of you yep. are our very yeah. favorite and dear listeners. We, so, uh, you can also talk with me on Twitter at Mr. Underscore R Star. Mm-hmm. You can find me on Twitter at Itinerant Baxter. And you should hop on Twitter or Facebook and let us know if there are any uh, sub- any subjects you'd like to hear us talk about. Anything Star Wars continue related. Continue doing that. Yeah, continue doing that. Thank you, Mark Burdett, for your recent one. We've had some other great ones as yeah. well. Those will be coming up in the future. Um, you know, some un, 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 very vague and unspecified amount of time in the future. Yep. We will get to those. Yes, Lindsay, we're getting to that and, one But too. we are always open for more and really excited to to be able to pander to the, our listeners. Yep. Absolutely. Oh boy. And um, also, we are coming up on the one year anniversary yes. of this podcast. We have something special planned for them. So, uh, Hopefully by the time this airs, I will have been prepared enough to get this going. If not, sorry, I'm only adequate. But we want to hear, like, I don't, the, my goal is I'm going to do, like, the little, like, Google survey thing. Mm-hmm. So I've got to set it up. I was trying to do it on my phone during the episode, and it just wasn't working. So yeah. whatever. Um, but I'm going to do, like, the Google survey. I want you guys to submit, like, favorite episodes, favorite quotes of yours, um, like funny moments you had if you've interacted with us, like what have like just any anything about the podcast that you have particularly loved in this last year, we would love to hear about that. And there will cross my fingers, hopefully be a link somewhere out there to said survey. And by somewhere thing. out there he means in the Facebook group and on our Twitter. Mm-hmm. Correct. <laughs> yep. And uh, so then go do that. 
And yes, you could submit multiple times or whatever. Yeah. So, until next week, may the Force be with you. Always. I'm Anna Graves, and thank you for listening to a more civilized podcast. Hey! Well done, everyone. Well done. Yeah, good news, good news. <laughs> it's been longer for me than you, and I'm still not over it, and I wasn't dating the man. <laughs> this is even worse than the Death Star was an inside job conspiracy. <laughs> And then Kylo Ren came. It's coming together. <laughs> My ridiculously circuitous plan is one quarter complete. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. I was laughing, though, because I was just like, you know, I got those dice for my sister for my birthday, put them in the car, and was like, <gasps> I've been trying to think of a name for this other than just the pumpkin, because that's what my family calls it, but I'm like, I don't want to, like, disrespect that, and then I was like, boom, Millennium Pumpkin, it's perfect, I love it, <laughs> and then it broke down, and I was like, ah, oh, oh. yeah, I should have seen that coming, I, I brought this on myself. Yeah. <laughs> Second I name her the Millennium Pumpkin, <laughs> no, the hyperdrive! <laughs> <laughs>